Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Key Takeaways from COP26. We welcome all attendees, and I hope everyone is doing well and keeping safe as we head into the holiday season. This is Anne-Marie Pizzatelli, and I'm the Global Head of Marketing for the Built Environment at the BSI Group. Today's topic is of great interest as we discuss COP26 and the key takeaways from the recent Global Climate Summit, which took place in Glasgow from October 31st to November 12th. We have a large audience today waiting to learn about this very important topic, so we'll get started right away by introducing today's speaker. Next slide. Keith Bryan leads the built environment for BSI Americas. Keith offers a variety of experience integrating holistic solutions into the built environment, including greenhouse gas accounting, climate change risk management, energy efficiency, resilience, environmental social governments, ESG, and green building programs. Prior to joining BSI, Keith worked in US federal government consulting, where he directly advised climate change action plans for multiple government agencies. Keith also worked for the US Green Building Council as program integration manager. Please welcome today's speaker, Keith Bryan. Great, thank you so much, Anne-Marie. It's great to be here. Thanks, Keith. We have uh, some great handouts for you today, including our sustainability report, a green print for the sustainable built environment, plus our very popular little book of BIM. So we have some great handouts today. However, you must complete the post-event survey, which will pop up right after the webinar is over in order to receive the special handouts. More about that later. We also have some polls in our webinar today, so please take part. Polls are a great way to engage with others on the webinar and gain insight as well. These polls are coming up right now, so let's get started and do our first poll. And let's launch our poll. What is your organization's biggest challenge with regards to net zero? Stakeholder disinterest, where to start, next steps, lack of resources to support, others please specify. So if you have other um, challenges, please put them in the questions box and we will uh, read them. So what is your organization's biggest challenge with net zero? And please select all that apply. Stakeholder disinterest, where to start next steps, lack of resources to support other, please specify. And we'll give everybody a chance to complete the polls. Okay, great. Jalpa, do you think that we, most of the people have voted and we have our results? Okay, great, let's see our results. What is your organization's biggest challenge with net, with net zero? 27% stakeholder disinterest, 65% where to start next steps, 38% lack of resources, to support interesting other uh, no responses. So it was a multiple choice answer. So we did get quite a varied uh, response range here. Keith, any comments? No, I think this falls in line with what we typically see out there in the market uh, where there are, uh, there's a lot of awareness of the topic, uh, but not necessarily a, a lot of information on where do we just, get our foot in the door to get started on this. So good information. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Keith. And Jalpa, let's go with our next poll now. Poll question number two now. Are you familiar with the Paris Agreement on climate change and the key commitments made? And please select one. Yes, I'm familiar with some aspects of the Paris Agreement. Yes, I am fully I fully understand the Paris Agreement commitments or no I am not familiar with the Paris Agreement. So, let's just wait for our um um uh, attendees to fill out this poll. This is very interesting. A question about the Paris Agreement on climate change which took place a few years ago. And uh we'll wait a few seconds and then Jalpa when you feel that most of the participants have voted, we will take a look at the results. Mm 
Okay, great. Let's look at, take a look at the results. Wow, it looks like uh, a large majority are familiar with some aspects of the Paris Agreement, and 2% fully understand the Paris Agreement commitments, and uh, some of our participants are not familiar with the Paris Agreement, which is great because Keith will cover uh, some aspects of the Paris Agreement in our uh, webinar today. So Keith, any surprises for you? Yeah, this is really interesting uh, that most people are familiar with the Paris Agreement. I, I think there's been a lot of talk about the significance of it over the last uh, five years or so since it happened. Uh, and I think it's pretty typical that most people don't understand all the in the weeds details. Uh, we're not going to touch on the weeds of the agreement, uh, but we are going to skim it to give some context as to what happened in the COP this year. So good to know. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. And now um, to our third question, um, our th poll question number three. Does your organization use the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, known as the UN SDGs, in developing sustainability objectives? Yes, we use them. Yes, we are aware of the UN SDGs, but are not utilizing them or no. So another interesting question, does your organization use the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in developing sustainability objectives? So we'll wait a few seconds. And when Jalpa, whenever you think most of the audience has voted, we will share the results with the audience. Okay. Let's see now. Yes, we use them. Great. 20% say they do use the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in setting their sustainability objectives. 32% are aware of the goals but are not using them. And 49% are not aware um, or do not use the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Very interesting results again. Keith, any comments? Yeah, I think this shows the breakdown between the, the attendees that we have on the webinar here. So we have, I would say, about 40% uh, from the U.S. and 40% from the U.K. Uh, and then, you know, a smattering of people from around the, the world here. Um, the U.S. is very aware of the, the SDGs, uh, but we tend to follow them more as a best practice. So this good information. Thank you. Great. Um, that's great to know. And uh, if we can close the poll, Jalpa, I'll use this uh, time to thank Jalpa for uh, producing our webinar today. And at this point, I will now hand over to Keith. Great. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie. And thank you to everyone for not only joining the webinar today, but for uh, taking our polls. It's always good to kind of get a, a gauge of the audience to see what sort of uh, knowledge you already have about the topics we're going to discuss. Uh, to see where we might be able to dive in a little bit more deeply. So um, today, as you know, uh, we're going to be discussing the key takeaways from COP26. Uh, COP26 was, of course, 14 days of discussions between, you know, 190 plus countries. So uh, there's obviously a lot that happened <laughs> during those those two weeks, uh, much more than I could possibly squeeze into a uh, one hour webinar. So we're certainly not going to uh, hit all the weeds of the discussions uh, that happened at COP26. So the goal of today is to cover the, I guess the lead up to the conference. And we talked a little bit about the, the Paris Agreement, which was uh, from one of the previous COPs and to touch on why those agreements were important uh, and why this year's COP was, was so important. Um, we also want to just briefly cover the outputs of COP26, so the official agreements that resulted, uh, mostly focusing on the what I would call the binding uh, implications uh, of COP26. There are also a variety of tangential uh, outcomes from the COP, um, you know, some handshake agreements, some tangential uh, type uh, conferences and agreements, and we're not going to dive in as deeply to those uh, just because there are so many of those to cover. So, um, and then we wanted to touch briefly on just some of the major events that surrounded uh, the conference itself. Um, as you know, when anything uh, of substance like this happens, there's always other types of related organizations that time the release of some of their major initiatives uh, to coincide with these types of conferences. So uh, we'll, we'll touch on a few of those 
to get into more depth on those, we're going to actually have a blog coming out in the next few weeks here uh, that'll that'll cover that kind of stuff uh, in a little bit more depth. So again, we're, we're sort of limited on time, so we don't want to dive too deeply in, into that. So um, my goals uh, for today's webinar are a, a, a few things, but one of the things that we're not going to do is get too deep into the weeds. Um, like I said, if you want to if you want to know about more about the details, uh, we will have a blog post coming out, and at the end, we're going to post our contact information. So feel free to, to reach out and, and talk to us if you want to know more about the details of what happened at COP26. Uh, we're also going to try not to get too political here. So these events can be highly sensitive uh, politically. Uh, so you know, this is evidenced, uh, I think. Um, most obviously by the the U.S. involvement in the Paris Agreement so over the last few years, where we were we committed to it and then we were out of it, and now we're back in the Paris Agreement, uh, largely due to political inclination. So uh, I tried to keep this presentation as apolitical as as possible and just touch on uh, the actual occurrences of COP26. So. Uh, with all of that being said, let's touch on uh, what I would call the, the lead up to COP26. So as the name indicates, uh, COP26, uh, COP in this case stands for Conference of Parties. Uh, this is the 26th annual event here. Um, even if you've never heard of COP uh, or any of the other 25 events, uh, I can almost guarantee, and from the results of our our web survey, it looked like most of the people have heard of the results of some of these COPs uh, of the past. So you might have heard of things like the Kyoto Protocol uh, that came out in 1998. Uh, it seemed like the majority of the audience on today's call has heard of the Paris Agreement that came out in 2015. Um, so on the screen here is just uh, some examples of some climate regulations, some agreements, best practices. Now, I'll apologize to my uh, uh, attendees around the globe here. This is very US focused. And the, the uh, intent of this slide is certainly not to have you read everything that's on the screen, but rather just to give you an idea that uh, you know this uh, climate regulation is uh, permeating our discussions over the last uh, you know 10 years, especially. Uh, and is really embedding itself in our day-to-day our -day operations now. For the purposes of today's call, I wanted to focus first on uh, that item in red there, the Paris Agreement, which you know, most of you have heard about. Uh, that was a result of COP21 uh, that happened in 2015. So before we get started in discussing that, I do like to just briefly, for people that are you know, sort of new to the climate change discussion, I like to talk about the, you know, the different types of issues that you will see uh, when you're talking about climate change. Broadly speaking, they fall into two major buckets. Uh, the first of those buckets is what I, what I call mitigation. So this is what we can do to decrease the impact that we are having on climate change, right? So this is when you hear about uh, decreasing greenhouse gases or carbon emissions or reduction of uh, burning of fossil fuels, uh, increasing carbon sinks, like planting more forests and whatnot, or just changing the way we process materials and, and uh, other sorts of processes. That all falls into the mitigation bucket. So for the built environment, this is like, how we operate our buildings, you know, what sorts of uh, fuel sources do we use? What's our balance between uh, electricity and natural gas and, and diesel and, and things like that when we're making operational decisions for our buildings? So that all falls into mitigation. The other major component of climate change is something called adaptation. So adaptation is um, changes that we can make as a population in either the physical infrastructure or the way that we approach uh, the way we design things or operate our buildings uh, that will buffer for the known impact. So, you know, we know that, uh, you know, storms are getting more intense. We know that there's more flooding. We know that there's more drought. We know that sea levels are rising. This is all stuff that is going to happen regardless of what we do, do on the mitigation front. Uh, and so we have to have discussions on, on how to brace for those impacts and 
and make sure that uh, they're having you know as, as little impact uh, as possible there. So those are sort of the two buckets that we're always talking about when it comes to climate change. So everything we talk about today will fall into one of those. So, like I mentioned, uh, you, you all have heard of the Paris Agreement, or most of you have heard of the Paris Agreement. Uh, the Paris Agreement was the result uh, of the talks of the Conference of Parties uh, 21, which was in 2015. And these were some of the major takeaways of, of the Paris Agreement. So there's, th this is obviously all distilled down into one very easy slide. So this is not, uh, this is not everything that happened. Uh, in the Paris Agreement, but this is the the kind of the meat of the agreement. So, uh, first and foremost, the 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 primary objective of the Paris Agreement is to limit global warming uh, to well below two degrees Celsius, preferably shooting for 1.5 degrees Celsius, and reach uh, peak greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. So. Um, most countries, I would say, are targeting the 2030 range uh, for peak greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, it, the Paris Agreement itself uh, just says as soon as possible. It also sets a requirement for countries to submit something called the nationally determined contributions every five years. Uh, so that speaks to the significance of COP26 because that is five years after the initial uh, Paris Agreement was was signed and agreed to. So our first uh, NDCs were submitted uh, in, in the lead up to COP26, which is uh, one of the reasons it's so significant. Uh, the third one, it identifies the needs for actions to build resilience. Uh, resilience falls under that adaptation category. So um, there's a whole framework that's involved there called the Enhanced Transparent, uh, excuse me, Enhanced Transparency Framework. Uh, that's just a you know way to compare apples to apples when it comes to um, resilience to climate change. Uh, it also establishes transparent reporting requirements. So those um, the transparent reporting kicks in in 2024 uh, after the uh, 2023 uh, submissions. So all of that stuff becomes public, and um, you can start to follow that on an annual basis. And then. Uh, these are non-binding commitments, uh, bullet number five there, but it does encourage the creation of long-term low greenhouse gas emission development strategies. So strategies to make sure that we are uh, building things uh, that are uh, releasing fewer emissions uh, when, when we build them. So on the screen, just as an example, I put both the uh, United Kingdom's nationally determined contribution and the United States. Uh, now, this, of course, is not uh, the entirety of the NDC that they submitted. This is just the uh, summary bullet. But as you can see, the United Kingdom uh, committed to at least a 68% reduction compared to 1990 levels. And the United States um, committed to a 50 to 52% reduction uh, below 2005 levels. So um, coming out of the uh, Glasgow conference, COP26, they actually uh, standardize the time frames that people are reporting to. So, you know, we're not uh, comparing uh, apples to oranges like, like these are, but just an example of two of the um, NDCs that came out. So uh, in the lead up to COP26, um, there was a uh, NDC synthesis report or just a, a culmination of all the countries NDCs and where that's leading us right so we'll start with uh, the good news right so like I mentioned one of the goals of uh, the Paris Agreement is to reduce or excuse me is to peak greenhouse gas emissions uh, as soon as possible so the good news is that looking at the NDCs that were submitted leading up to uh, COP26, if you know, if we take into account full implementation of those NDCs, including all the conditional elements, which includes uh, things like uh, you know, planting more trees and whatnot, um, that does indicate the possibility of global emissions peaking before 2030. So that that's great, great news. Uh, the caveat there is that post 2030, it's not looking as progressive. So if you follow that uh, 
that yellow line, uh, that's where our, the NDCs that were submitted this, this year would lead us. Uh, and all the blue blue uh, areas down below uh, correspond to the two degrees warming, 1.5 degrees warming, et cetera. So as you can see, even though we are, uh, there's a possibility of us peaking in 2030, after that it, it gets a little, uh, a little less sure. So a lot of the focus and a lot of uh, the uh, urgency in COP26 really focused on uh, what we were going to do to ramp up efforts leading to 2030 and and then make sure that uh, we are um, decreasing those global emissions even further uh, coming out of um, coming out of 2030 so um, this is uh, sorry. This is just a, a summary of what uh, what I just kind of mentioned there. So the the goal of COP twenty COP twenty six was uh, to really ramp up what we what we're already sort of doing. So now, I would say this this was sort of expected uh, because uh, this is the initiation of uh, real tangible actions uh, to limit climate climate change or greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, so the, the you know. The fact that it's peaking in 2030 shows that short-term focus, uh, and I would say it's it's pretty much expected. So, another gap that was uh, that was called out in the synthesis report is that there was a large focus on mitigation, so the reduction of uh, emissions, and less of a focus on the adaptation portion of things. So, the the graph that you see on the right here shows the percentage of um, country NDCs that actually mentioned adaptation or different uh, components of adaptation in their NDCs and what they had committed to. Uh, and as you can see, there's uh, you know there's a substantial amount of these that are well below uh, 50%. So uh, one of the other primary goals coming out of COP26 was to really boost the commitment to the adaptation side of uh, of the equation here. And then, you know, I like to, we can really get down in a wormhole here uh, talking about the, the negatives that came out of, uh, you know, discussions like this. Uh, so, you know, I, I like to focus a little bit on the humor here. So <laughs> just some public reaction uh, to COP26. Of course, some of it was negative, pointing out that uh, the emissions were not uh, decreasing or the commitments were not decreasing emissions enough uh, to get us to where we ultimately need to be. Uh, and so you have you have uh, satirical articles like the one on the left there uh, from a, a, a website called The Onion, which is one of my uh, favorite humor websites. That says climate summit uh, sets ambitious goal to phase out fossil fuels by the time Earth runs out of them. Which <laughs> obviously comical, uh, but this is uh, you know this is the takeaway from things like that synthesis report. And then uh, you know. Uh, if you follow climate change at all, Greta, of course, has been uh, the unofficial or perhaps official face of the climate youth uh, movement, and uh, she was fairly critical of the the uh, synthesis report and and all the commitments that had made uh, been made thus far. So, um, just moving on here. So now I want to dive into. Um, the actual outcomes of the official discussions during during COP26. So um, the the output of that is known as the Glasgow uh, Climate Pact. Excuse me. <clears throat> so first and foremost, they wanted to uh, indicate that there was an ongoing commitment to the uh, the Paris Agreement uh, that you know happened in 2015. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so they recommitted to uh, focusing on that 1.5 uh, degree target. Uh, however, a lot of the um, the scrutiny or, or the uh, crit critique in some of the past COPs is that even though there was focus on uh, meeting those those 1.5 or 2 degree targets, uh, there wasn't necessarily a, a huge alignment between the actions that needed to be taken. In order to uh, in order to get there, and and some of the commitments that the countries were making. So, um, one of the outcomes of uh, COP26 
was to really start uh, welcoming the input of you know scientific fact uh, into the discussion. So they uh, started uh, pulling in input from the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, which uh, just released its uh, most recent report uh, this year, at least the, the first version of that report, which uh, is n not good news, <laughs> I should say. Um, and then they also welcomed input from the World Meteorolo Meteorological Organization, the WMO, uh, as far as how uh, to go forward with uh, some of the actions for climate change. And then it stressed the urgency of increasing mitigation goals. So saying what we're already committing to is not enough. Uh, we really need to uh, boost those mitigation goals, not only up through 2030, but uh, going beyond to uh, to cause more of a significant dip in that yellow line that we had seen previously. So. The next thing that they focused on for the Glasgow Pact uh, was adaptation. So, uh, you know, the other piece that uh, we really uh, touched on a moment ago. So coming out of 2015, countries hadn't really agreed uh, how the goal of adaptation should be delivered. Uh, so, you know, you can see the results of that in the synthesis reports that came out. Uh, in that a lot of countries just didn't uh, didn't mention it or ver mentioned very little about adaptation. Um, and so we actually, uh, during during the um, the talks, uh, they implemented this uh, two year work program called the GLASS work program um, that is going to help actually implement a, a lot of the the actions that that uh, were put into place during the uh, the 2015 Paris agreement. So helps with uh, national planning and Im implementation, uh, helps with just global understanding of adaptation, um, uh, strengthens, you know, some of the Im implementation of adaptation actions in, you know, developing countries, uh, that, that sort of thing. So uh, all right. Uh, ne the next bit that we want to talk about is something called adaptation finance. Um, so, as with adaptation, uh, the financing that was committed to by countries coming out of uh, 2015, the Paris Agreement, uh, was primarily revolving around the mitig mitigation uh, piece. So, um, only 25% of financing was uh, slotted for the adaptation uh, piece. Now, small island developing states and uh, LDCs, least developed countries, um, are significantly impacted by uh, the current results uh, of climate change, right? So you see a, a lot of rising seawater, you see a lot of flooding, et cetera. Uh, and so there was uh, an impetus there to really make sure that we're financing uh, the ability to be more resilient uh, to those types of changes. So uh, there was a, a very strong call for developed countries to double their efforts uh, or double their financing when it comes to uh, helping to fund adaptation. And then uh, there was actually a, a round of, of uh, financing uh, that raised uh, raised the adaptation fund up to 350 million. Uh, and then really they wanted to not only just call for government commitment, but uh, e enable private financing uh, for these types of actions. Uh, so there was uh, that was also embedded into uh, the out excuse me the outcomes of, of COP26. As I mentioned a bit ago, so you know there are uh, some efforts, of course, being taken to to mitigate the impacts of climate change, um, but they did want to stress that the uh, collective progress to date uh, is not sufficient. All right, so we might be peaking our emissions, but we're certainly nowhere near hitting that uh, two degree or 1.5 degree goal. I think uh, the commitments thus far are landing us right around 2.7 degrees of anticipated warming. Uh, so, you know, obviously that's not uh, in alignment with, with the Paris Agreement. So, uh, the the outcomes of uh, COP26 really encouraged countries to uh, show a stronger commitment to that uh, one point five degree target, uh, acknowledging that science coming out of IPCC in places of that sort. 
they also established um, annual meetings to talk about um, what we can do prior to 2030. So it's you know it's great that we're going to you know ideally peak in the, the 2030 range, but uh, you know in in the perfect world we'd want to peak uh, before that and, and even start uh, heading you know, downwards before that. So. And then uh, the other the other event that came out here is the synthesis report that uh, was published for the first time uh, this year with all the submissions of the NDCs is now going to be an annual occurrence. So uh, countries uh, are committed to submit their NDCs at least every five years, but they can uh, certainly submit them more uh, frequently. And as uh, countries submit those, that synthesis report will show that progress on an annual basis. So we'll actually be able to see uh, ongoing progress rather than just uh, once every five years uh, for the mitigation. Next major issue here is finance, technology transfer, and capacity building for mitigation and adaptation. So, um, you know, uh, climate change is a, is a global phenomenon, and so that uh, that is always a challenging discussion when you're when you're talking about it from a country perspective. Uh, so, developing nations need uh, both financial and technological support in order to be be able to do some of the things uh, that are required in order to adapt to climate change and uh, even to mitigate climate change. Things like switching away from uh, coal power and, and what have you uh, re require you know just basic financing and technology. So um, this the you know the the burden or the, or the onus of this really comes down to uh, the more developed nations uh, to provide some of that financing because climate change is really a, a global issue. So um, the countries in, uh, in Glasgow uh, agreed to continue to the discussions on this. Obviously, there's sensitivity here, uh, you know, from a political perspective, as far as, uh, you know, providing finance uh, that uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't go to, to your particular country. So um, there is a, a stated goal uh, of the Paris Agreement to raise 100 billion in annual financing, uh, and that that goal has not yet been met. So they're really trying to focus on how do we get uh, to to that uh, that mark there. So they've established annual progress reports uh, to show you know what we are doing and what can be done, uh, and then they also saw the creation of um, four action groups uh, coming out of uh, a committee called the uh, COP26 Catalyst for Climate Action uh, to focus on uh, action in, in developing countries. So adaptation access, action, excuse me, access to finance, um, carbon market participation, and uh, just focus on transparency and reporting. As I just mentioned, you know, climate change, like we all we all know uh, intuitively, uh, climate change is a, is a global issue. Uh, however, you know, it needs to be solved at a, at a local level. Um, when we are talking about things from, uh, or, or excuse me, the effects like loss and damage as a result uh, of climate change, um, there's there's still some disagreement on. Uh, you know how we deal with the liability and compensation that that surrounds that, right? Um, so the biggest emitters of, of global global greenhouse gases, uh, generally speaking, are not the ones that are being uh, most heavily affected by climate change. So you know when we look at loss and damage damage from climate change, um, there are three main things to take into account. Number, number one, uh, first and foremost, it exceeds the ability to adapt. So no matter what we do, uh, we cannot adapt quickly enough to completely negate the effects of climate change uh, on our um, on our civilization. Right? Uh, number two, the effects are not localized. So you know what we do in the United States is not limited to only impacting the United States. It, it has a global uh, impact that like I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, impacts other countries. So uh, our actions uh, impact other people. And number three, uh, even if we were to completely eliminate greenhouse gas emissions today, uh, the effects of climate change are expected to increase uh, or continue to increase uh, for uh, still a time being. So we need to figure out how uh, to 
really buffer for these impacts. Um, so out, coming out of the uh, COP26, there was a couple main outputs here. One of them is they uh, they really formalized and funded uh, something called the Santiago Netflo Network that uh, clarifies the, uh, excuse me, it clarifies the, the functions and the process for how we deal with loss and damage uh, from the effects of climate change. And then it also established uh, the, the Glasgow Dialogue to uh, continue the discussion on how funds are applied and, and how to, to fairly assess uh, liability and, and compensation when it comes to loss and damage. One of the last things that they focused on was uh, just implementation. So, you know, one of the, the critiques uh, the coming out of previous COPs was that there's a lot of high level talk that occurs at, at these uh, conference of parties um, that doesn't always translate into implementation. And a lot of that is not lack of intent, uh, but lack of uh, consensus on, you know, how, how we're going to measure this, uh, how, how we're actually going to put this into effect um, in, a, in a country basis. So uh, they really wanted to get further detail uh, to fully what they called operationalize that Paris Agreement uh, so that people could start actually doing some of these things more effectively. So um, part of this uh, was the submission of the nationally determined contributions, which we saw uh, in that synthesis report. So that uh, reporting is a great first step to to enable transparency and enable uh, you know binding commitment uh, by the co countries that are in the agreement uh, in order to actually start doing this stuff. So as you can imagine, um, you know the the talks at the COP uh, uh, all the COPs are high level, right? They're they're held between uh, leaders of countries, but. Uh, the action that happens is really at that local level, and it's what happens when you when you come back and start uh, operationalizing this stuff. They also agreed on um, some of the uh, political differences that uh, inhibited the um, implementation of something called the Paris Rulebook. Um, so I previously mentioned things like synchronization of of time frames. Um, you know, we we had the UK and the US. Uh, uh, operating off of different baselines, uh, that sort of thing. They came to an agreement on those, and that's something called the Paris Rule Book, uh, and that helps to just, uh, like I said, compare apples to apples, uh, so that everybody's kind of looking at things from the same perspective. Finally, uh, we get to something uh, collaboration. So, uh, climate change is an all-inclusive discussion. Um, and the critique in the past has been that, uh, you know, leaders uh, you know, sit in their, uh, whatever, the ivory towers and have discussions uh, and aren't super inclusive on, um, you know, all of the stakeholders that need to be involved in here. So um, we saw lack of inclusion of uh, you know, women. We, lack, we saw lack of inclusion of indigenous peoples uh, in various nations. Uh, youth were uh, notoriously excluded or, you know, sort of given a, a head nod there. So the outcomes of uh, COP26 really wanted to stress uh, the, the collaboration pathways uh, that were uh, uh, available here. So we saw things like the Action for Climate Empowerment uh, that were enabled, which is uh, really focusing on education and training, public awareness and access to information surrounding climate change. Uh, they we uh, they introduced a, a gender action plan, which uh, you know just of, of course continues to uh, encourage um, um, participation, uh, not just participation but actual meaningful participation uh, from women around the world. Um, inclusion of uh, indigenous peoples uh, across the world. So there was already a work group uh, associated with this, but that they uh, considered that successful and uh, continued to implement that. And then they also launched uh, something called the 2030 Breakthroughs, which are um, targeted at uh, 30 uh, key sectors in, in the economy. So built environment is one of those, uh, transportation, uh, things, things of that sort, and really looking at ways that we can start to implement things in those key sectors to start to make, make a difference. And um, 
uh, we'll, we'll touch about I'll touch on that in just a moment here. So now, like I mentioned, there were a variety of other uh, events that happened uh, surrounding uh, COP26 and in association with COP26 that were not official outcomes of the talks, but uh, but certainly related and uh, in conjunction with those. Uh, so I just wanted to briefly touch on those. There's absolutely no way that I can uh, hit every single one of those, but um, but we can uh, talk in, in detail about that uh, in the future if, if any of you guys are interested. So one of them that I uh, really wanted to point out here is the, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of I ISO. Um, ISO released something called the London Declaration, which uh, the, the long and short of it is that they have now agreed to integrate uh, climate change into all future um, ISO uh, um, releases, right? So any ISO that comes out uh, from now on will have a, an element of how this impacts uh, the climate. So that was a, a huge announcement from, from ISO, obviously BSI is the national standards body in the UK, so uh, this will uh, directly affect our uh, work in the UK, uh, but it really impacts uh, everybody globally now that uh, ISOs will all include uh, climate commitment. Uh, in conjunction, the, the United Kingdom Green Building Council, in Gre excuse me, uh, they, they released their uh, whole life carbon roadmap uh, to the built environment. So that's uh, exciting. And a whole new work group was established. Um, then uh, it's called the uh, Beyond Oil and Gas uh, Alliance, and they uh, it's a, a, an agreement between a variety of nations uh, that is has the obvious goal of getting past uh, the use of, of fossil fuels. And then, like I already mentioned, uh, there's these Glasgow breakthroughs and, and the 2030 breakthroughs, uh, which have um, implications on the private sector and some of the actions that we can take uh in order to actually um operationalize some of the the talks that came out of the cop 26 discussions so now i will turn it back over to uh Anne marie to just talk a little bit about uh bsi and then open it up for questions and, and comments thank you keith um a little bit about bsi our purpose is inspiring trust for a more resilient world. We help to shape and guide innovation through improving and standardizing business processes, products and services to enable advancement. We'd like to make our clients future ready. We are independent and free from any outside influence as all profit is reinvested back into BSI to help us to continue to support and drive further change and advancement in industry. We are an integrated global enterprise with 84,000 clients in 193 countries across the world and 128,000 client sites. We have a strong global footprint and our clients range from globally recognized brands to small local businesses. A bit about BSI Solutions, we offer standards, as Keith talked about, training, certification, and consulting services. Standards include ISO, 19, uh, ISO 14001 for environmental management and an ISO 50001 for energy management. We offer both training and system certification for these important standards, as well as other ISO standards. We also include BIM training, business information modeling for fundamentals, project delivery, and handover information exchange. Other solutions include product certification for ISO 19650 BIM and BSI consulting services for EHS construction and, of course, sustainability consulting. If you are interested in any of our BSI solutions, please indicate this on the post-event survey, which will pop up as soon as the webinar is finished. And on the next slide, once again, um, here are our featured handouts. For today, we have the little book of BIM, the famous little BSI book of BIM. We have our BIM perspectives case studies and our great sustainability report, a green print for the sustainable built environment. And again, once again, complete the post-event survey to be able to get our featured handouts. And now let's go to some Q&A. I think we have a little bit of time for Q&A. We do have some questions, Keith. Um, I'll go to the first one. 
how can an organization get started to develop a sustainability plan and objectives? How can an organization get started? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I think the most important thing uh, that, that you can do as an organization is to set your priorities, right? So not every organization has the same priority when it comes to sustainability or uh, greenhouse gas emissions or what have you. So you really need to decide what is important to your organization and focus on that. I wouldn't say exclusively, but primarily uh, as your initial round. The, the second most important thing to do is once you've decided what your goals are, is to measure them, right? Figure out where you are right now. It, it's uh, very easy to set you know, lofty goals for what you want to do going forward, um, but it's uh, without having some sort of baseline to operate from, uh, it, it's going to be hard to uh, quantify those changes and really see what your progress has been uh, thus far. Okay, great. Thanks, Keith. We have a long question here, so um, bear with me as I go through it, but it's an interesting one. Worldwide, in order for societies and economies to maintain vitality, energy, and resources needed to be maintained in reliability, as well as increasing in scale, in order to account for these needs and still address the issues of mitigation and adaptation, as highlighted by COPS, in what ways are countries seeking to integrate the development, use, and improvement in nuclear energy? production to help meet such energy needs and at the same time help improve the general emission of con that contributes to fossil fuels and its impact on the environment. So nuclear energy. Yeah, great question. Uh, so nuclear energy obviously has some political sensitivity uh, as well uh, to it. I, I think there in at least in recent years, there's been a little bit more acknowledgement that uh, nuclear will probably pe play a part in the energy transition as we move away from fossil fuels and as we ramp up uh, some of the more renewable energy technologies. Um, you know, if we were to completely get rid of uh, coal and gas what and whatnot, we would not uh, be able to, to function effectively right now. So uh, the the buffering of that transition will likely fall heavily to nuclear. Um, so we've seen, at least in the United States, we've seen a ramping down of coal production uh, and coal use to generate electricity, um, primarily due to natural gas being so cheap. Um, but in recent months, natural gas has uh, started to increase in price. and And so you know, coal use has actually gone back up. So um, there's, a, there's a whole discussion that, that we could have here about uh, the role of, of nuclear, uh, but I, I see it as a, like I said, a, a buffering technology that leads us from, you know, a heavily fossil fuel based uh, energy production environment into more of a uh, heavily reliant on renewable energy technology type environment uh, with nuclear being that uh, that buffer in between. But there's various perspectives on this. There, there's certainly no, uh, no black and white and happy to discuss it further with anybody that wants to talk about it. Okay, interesting. We're getting a lot of political comments today. I won't uh, uh, use them all um, comments, but here's an interesting one. Comment, is working from home the way to support forward to support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? Would that support them? Boy, there's a lot to unpack in that question. Uh, <laughs> So there are pros and cons to working from home. Um, yeah, I think we might have to defer this to to a to a more detail. We could actually make a whole webinar out of that. But um, yes, there are, there are positives to working from home. So you know we can see things like decrease in transportation emissions. We can see um, things. Uh, like uh, reduction in uh, electricity generation from buildings, but then you see subsequent increase in electricity use in the residential sector. So um, it again, it's it's one of those issues that um, if you if the question is uh, is work for home from home the solution to greenhouse gas emissions, the answer is no. Uh, but is it possibly a component? Uh, of that final solution? Yeah, sure, it, it could be. Uh, there's always going to be a balance. Uh, 
uh, to to that conversation. But it's not the one and only uh, thing that's going to get us uh, to the the finish line for uh, things like the Paris Agreement. Okay, great. I think all countries, you know, um, could do more absolutely for um, sustainability and um, for mitigation, as you said, Keith, absolutely. I think that's all of the questions for today. And thank you for asking the questions that everyone did. I'd like to take this opportunity now, if we could go to the next slide, um, to thank everyone for t attending today's webinar. We did want to put up our contact information for everybody. And uh, thank you everybody for attending today. And thank you especially to our speaker, Keith Bryan, great presentation, Keith. All participants today will receive the link to the recording of this webinar, many are asking, uh, as well as links to our featured handouts, the Little Book of BIM, uh, Perspectives Case Studies, and our sustainability report, a green print for the built environment. However, please do complete the post-event survey so you'll make sure to get all our featured handouts. Once again, thank you all for attending and have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.